Dr. Elizabeth Scott. Dr. Scott has degrees in anthropology from the universities of Georgia, Florida, and Minnesota with specialties in historical, feminist, United States, and zoo archaeology. She has taught at Washington and Lee, Southeast Missouri State University, and at Illinois State University. Since 2014, Dr. Scott is Associate Professor of Emerita of Anthropology at Illinois State University. She has given numerous public lectures, published articles, conducted peer reviews, and edited publications. And from 2002 to 2005, Dr. Scott co-chaired the annual conference on French settlements and culture in North America and the Caribbean. Today, Dr. Scott will present Archaeology at the Green Tree Tavern. Uh, you saw yesterday, you were at the dedication of, of current work and also building on a previous work and with friends of hers. Uh, based on historical archaeological studies at that site over a nine-year period. Please help me welcome Dr. Elizabeth Scott. like to thank the DNR and Les Amis for all they did to make it possible that this wonderful building is going to be open to the public now and um, that that message can get out there um, from the walls themselves as it were. Okay. Around 1700 the French began settling the Mississippi Valley in earnest with initial agricultural villages established at Cahokia and Kaskaskia. Along with agriculture, lead mining, fur trading, and salt production formed the colonial economy. Population growth resulted in expansion into new settlements in what is now Illinois and, by the early 1750s, on the western side of the Mississippi at St. Genevieve. This breadbasket was responsible for most of the wheat grown in France's colonies. <clears throat> and was dependent upon for daily bread, literally, up and down the Mississippi Valley, especially in New Orleans. The French colonists utilized uh, long lot agriculture, a practice that originated in, um, in France, and um, photo credits. The present town of St. Genevieve, Missouri, uh, was established in the late 18, 1780s and early 1790s when residents moved up from the original town in the floodplain after a series of disastrous floods. Houses were located in town, and individuals owned long agricultural lots in the big field, Le Grand Champ, south of town. Some of the owners marked their long lot boundaries by planting pecan trees, a few of which remain today. This and the field at Perry de Rocher are two of a very few examples of French colonial agricultural landscapes surviving in the U.S. Although under Spanish colonial rule after 1763, and including ever more Anglo-Americans, especially after 1803, St. Genevieve remained overwhelmingly French in character and in population into the 1840s. While most of the material culture recovered archaeologically for this period is British or Anglo-American in origin, and this is due to British ceramics flooding the global market uh, in, the, in the early 1800s, French cultural traditions persisted in language, religion, and legal practices, as well as the town plans and architecture visible to us today and archaeologically. <laughs> Sally Reeves has studied detailed maps and drawings that were made of New Orleans and found that the urban lots there were a combination of workspace, gardens, and orchards. The workspace included barns, stables, slave quarters, kitchens, animal coops, um, and various other outbuildings. Vegetable and flower gardens were there, as well as fruit orchards. All was arranged to provide both production and beauty and relaxation. 
stables, barns, kitchens, and slave quarters were found relatively close to the main house. <clears throat> Often the gardens and orchard were located next on the lot, and at the back of the lot were the chicken coops, pigeonaires, and other animal coops in what's called the lower yard of the Bascoura. Um, depictions of Louisiana town <coughs> lots, town lots and plantations may also be seen in a set of watercolors made along the Mississippi River in the 1850s. And here you can see some of that combination of formal plantings, orchards, and the outbuildings out uh, toward the back. These sources have helped us interpret the town lots in St. Genevieve and are useful in understanding earlier towns such as Kaskaskia and later towns such as St. Louis. In all the French settlements, the town lots had palisades around them, similar to the one seen here at the Bolduc House in St. Genevieve. Although these fences also served de defensive purposes, the real purpose was to keep cows and pigs out of the yard and on the streets where they belong. <laughs> at, one of these, at one of these town lots, the Janus Ziegler site, we have found a ditch for one such fence. It is five feet in front of, in front of the house. Showed up first as this dark stain from the wood. And then you can see look closely, you can see the, the posts, which are gray. It's five feet in front of the house, which is exactly the distance of the fence in front of the boulder. I went over there immediately when we found it and measured the house. <laughs> Although we did recover a rosary bead, a rosary bead, a rosary bead and chain in the ditch, little else was found there, suggesting the fence was built early in the Janus occupation of the structure, and that was from 1790 to 1833. When the Janus property was sold to the Ziegler's in 1833, the deed described it as having a barn, a stable, a garden, an orchard, and outbuildings. This is an 1880 photograph which shows a large barn to the south of the main house. If you look really close, you can see it back here. Possibly on the same location as an earlier barn. Um, an aerial photo from 1938 shows what might be the remnants of an orchard, but additional archeological excavations would be needed to confirm this. We have, however, found evidence of two outbuildings fairly close to the house. Well, as listen, my I'm sorry, I have to interrupt. Is that stone wall in this photograph, the wall that is there right now? This wall right here? Yeah. Yes. Well, as far as I know, and the Goldman's knew, that's the wall. That is there right now. It's there right now. Cool. What's amazing to me is this wall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This was for Channel and the Creek. And this, of course, is where the road is right now, the bridge right here with the town. Oh, sorry. Okay. So we found two outbuildings, um, both fairly close to the house, as might be expected. And I'll be talking mostly about one of these today. Uh, the analysis is preliminary, but it's yielding some interesting information about the methods and date of construction and material remains associated with it in a variety of activities. So who was on this property? Although thousands of miles separated the thinly scattered French colonists in North America, Individuals and families maintained lasting business and kinship ties between New France, Louisiana, and France. The Janus family gives us one example. Nicholas Francois Janine, <coughs> Janus, I just recently learned that it's supposed to be Janus, from a Quebecois archaeologist, and for 10 years I've been telling students to say Janine, like Paris. Okay, so I won't try to figure it out. But <laughs> Nicholas Francois Janus was born at Quebec in 1720. His father, Francois Janus, was born in Champagne around 1676 and emigrated to Trois-Rivières, Canada, where he married Simone Brosseau in 1704. Nicholas and one of his brothers, Francois Eustache, were both engaged in fur trading in the Western Great Lakes in the late 1730s and early 1740s. From 1740 to 43, Nicholas traveled to the post at Green Bay, Wisconsin, then returned to Montreal then traveled to the post at St. Joseph in Niles, Michigan, returning to Montreal, presumably engaged in fur trading activities for various Montreal merchants. By 1747, he was himself a successful merchant in Kaskaskia, in what is known as um, the Illinois country or Upper Louisiana, buying and selling land on both sides of the river. 
1751, he married Marie-Louise Tamir de la Source, who had also been born in Quebec, and they raised eight children in Kaskaskia. Like most of the residents of Kaskaskia, he lived in the town there and owned farmland across the river in the big field, at least by 1752. Although Nicholas sold his home, in, his home and lot in Kaskaskia in 1785, quote, for 700 leaves payable in money or peltry, unquote, he did not buy the property where the Green Tree Tavern stands until 1790 from Antoine Dufour. This property was in the new St. Genevieve, the settlement of which in the late 1780s and early 1790s coincided with a large migration of French descended peoples to the west of the Mississippi. <laughs> American settlers and governmental authority by this time had become a presence to be reckoned with on the east side, and most settlers of French heritage chose to live in what was still Spanish territory across the river rather than stay in Illinois under the Americans. One of the consequences of this migration, this was <coughs> primarily to St. Genevieve and St. Louis, was the Spanish government's commission of a census to document this unexpectedly large increase in population. On the 1791 census, Nicholas Janus is listed as a resident in St. Genevieve with two white males and two white females in the household, six Negro distinguished from mulatto men slaves and four Negro women slaves. He also possessed at the time 200 bushels of wheat, 400 bushels of corn, and 800 pounds of tobacco, but no lead and no salt. Through the marriages of their children, Nicholas and Marie Louise were related to three of the most prominent families in St. Genevieve, Bolduc, Beauvais, and Bienvenu. Thus, the Janices had been in the area at the time the Green Tree was built for more than 40 years, were a well-established, prominent family, and were situated well in St. Genevieve society. Nicholas, now about 70 years old, and his eldest son, Francois, built this structure, or rather his slaves built it, in 1790 to 91. It's of a classic <coughs> French vernacular style, the vertical square posts on sylvine, which rests on a stone first floor wall. Bouselage, which in this case is clay mixed with wheat straw, was packed in between the upright posts, and then the whole was whitewashed. The large overhanging porches added additional protection to this earth bath building. This is a raised Creole cottage. A raised Creole cottage with the ground floor serving as storage or workspace and the raised first floor as the living area. And you can see that there are multiple doors on the front uh, related to the combination of domicile and tavern under one roof. Um, now the ground floor has two rooms. On one under the tavern end of the building you see here with an entrance to the front um, and the street. And one under the domicile portion of the building with an entrance to the backyard. And there was no um, entrance. The rooms were separated by um, a wall uh, within that ground floor, so there was no interaction. Although the records don't mention a tavern operating here until 1803, architectural restoration indicated that the, bu the building had this appearance from the beginning, suggesting that there was at least an intention of operating a tavern earlier, perhaps, than 1803. Nicholas's wife, Marie-Louise Janice, died in 1791 at the age of 54. In 1792, the son, Francois, was married, and he and his wife, Pelagi, lived in this house, raising their family of nine children here. In 1796, Nicholas, the father, deeded the property to Francois, and it may be that he began operating the tavern soon thereafter. Nicholas continued to live in the house until he died in 1804 at the ripe old age of 84. In 1807, the tavern became the meeting place for the Louisiana Lodge Number 109, the first Freemason's Lodge west of the Mississippi. It remained at this location for 15 years. The meeting place was in the tavern, end of the building. Various Masonic symbols were carved into the gallery posts on the eastern side, the street side of the building. And that was always one of the, um, one of the um, great parts of Hilliard Goldman's tour of the building was the get in the basement and be able to see those original posts. In 1830, the household consisted of Francois and Pelagie, who were both 60 to 70 years old by now, uh, two males and one female, plus 10 uh, slaves. On the tax list accompanying the 1830 census, Francois owned 
238 acres of land in the big field and hills of St. Genevieve, and this was valued at $245. The house and lot in town were valued at $1,000. He also owned nine slaves, valued at $2,250. Uh, and his, his real and personal property totaled $3,651. Kalaji Jani Nabianu died in September 1832 at the age of 63. The next month, Francois died at the age of 71. In January of 1833, his estate was worth more. It was worth 3856 then. It was divided among seven heirs, each receiving a portion of slaves, furniture, farm equipment, animals, household items, cash, and real estate. Francois's property now included seven slaves, um, five men, one man, and one boy, worth a total of $1,900. And the house and lot in town were still valued at $1,000. And so what can the material culture tell us about the occupants of this town lot and the activities they carried on? Excavations by Illinois State University since 2006 and by my significant other, Dr. Donald Kelvin, um, teaching these field schools uh, have revealed portions of two outbuildings as well as evidence of a variety of activities in the front and backyards of the main house. While this is the subject of ongoing research and therefore preliminary, several things are apparent thus far. First, we can see several differences between the main house and the outbuildings. The main house is a raised Creole cottage with squared posts on a sill on a stone ground floor. The outbuilding I'm discussing here, which these are um, flagstone steps leading out from the back porch. Um, it's made of posts in the ground, placed in a wall ditch. Um, so in here you can see the stains outlined perhaps in the ditch. And then after the excavation of the posts themselves, you can see here. Um, some effort was made to make this outbuilding sturdy. The ends of the posts had been charred to a point and then driven into the ditch. And this charring acts to ward off deterioration by moisture and insects. And the point, of course, would make it a sturdier wall when you're driving it into the ditch. There's no question, however, that the main house, well, not this one, but okay, that the main house was meant to last longer and to make a statement about the social position of the Janus family. It's possible that it was built on a stone first floor as a precaution against future disastrous floods, such as those the community had just witnessed in the 1780s. This was the reasoning, for example, behind the largest structure in town built by Jean-Baptiste Vallée. However, all wealthy residents did not build post on sill houses. The two Beauvais brothers, and this is the, uh, hmm. Amro, Bobe Amro. Um, these were some of the wealthier men in town. They still built their houses in the post in the ground style. Of course, this is much grander than the outbuilding. Um, an early hand painted pearlware bowl was found in the fill for that wall ditch behind the house. Um, as were a few other artifacts. So this indicates that the outbuilding behind the house was built early on in the Janus occupation, but after some occupation had been there so that there was trash to get put into, into the wall ditch. Other differences stand out. Other differences stand out between the Janus period main house and this outbuilding. Expensive ceramics, like transfer print kind of ceramics and wine glass fragments, those were found only at the main house. However, both assemblages really had mostly middle tier and, and low economic um, uh, ceramic wares. Interestingly, no faience, a French pin glazed earthenware, is found in either location during the French period on the site, although it does show up in later levels. A much greater quantity of coal, cinder, and charcoal, evidence of cooking and laundering, is present in the outbuilding as well. So you have more food preparation and then more of the um, cooking and laundry. Cottage industries, industries such as lead shot manufacture and production of catlinite items for the fur trade seem to have taken place at the outbuilding, but not in the main house. And this 
These are uh, lead trailers that are mistakes that you make when you're trying to make lead shot. So they're evidence of the, the lead cooling off too fast before it hits water and forms a ball. Um, but that's some evidence of, of production itself. Few clothing or dormant items were found in either location. And I can't really explain this. Um, it may be that the outbuilding was a kitchen mostly and nobody really lived there. However, as a main house, we know there were a lot of people living there, so I'm not exactly sure why we don't have too many um, clothing items. An outbuilding in ill repair um, would have needed frequent attention, and perhaps the fact that there are a greater number of nails at the outbuilding can be attributed to trying to use weatherboarding or uh, wooden shingles. A greater amounts of brick and lime mortar and fuselage fragments might attest to these kinds of repairs. Since the main house is still standing, right, we would expect much less structural debris there. Uh, also, it was protected by layers and layers of whitewash and the porch itself. We have evidence for fur trading activities being carried out in front of the building, outside the tavern end of the structure. There, glass seed beads and necklace <coughs> beads and myriad sizes of lead shot, this is the, like, the dime, um, wow. far more than anywhere else on the site, on a cluster in that, in that area. In addition, thin metal tubes with hide or fur extending from them have been recovered. And these are similar to ornaments sewn on Native American uh, clothing. So it seems that Native groups were restricted to the public portion of the property near the palisaded uh, boundary. Okay, now we're gonna switch to the German occupation of the same property. Three Ziegler brothers, uh, Matthias and Francis, Francois and Sebastian, or Francis or Franz, uh, both, arrived in Missouri sometime before 1821. They possibly had a sister, Rosine Ziegler Cromer, who arrived in St. Genevieve in the late 1820s. <laughs> Matthias and his wife, Barbara Hefner, had immigrated from Baden, Bavaria, and lived elsewhere in St. Genevieve until 1833. This is the 1830 census, and Matthias is listed um, living a couple of doors away from his older brothers, Francis and Sebastian. Um, and this is Sebastian and Francis. Well, I can't see it from here. It's there. They're just two doors away. Um, somewhere else in St. Genevieve. <coughs> the household included Barbara and five children, and a sixth was born in 1832. On the tax list for 1830, Matthias owned two cows, valued at $16, and paid a poll tax of 50 cents. The Zieglers were some of the earliest German-speaking residents in St. Genevieve. On the 1830 census and tax list, there are less than a dozen German surnames, and that's including theirs. On April 20th, 1833, Matthias Ziegler bought the Green Tree Tavern property from the heirs of Francois Genie, Janice, for $1,410 to be paid over a period of six years. He was a tobacconist, a wholesale producer of tobacco products, supplying merchants and tavern keepers in the town. Um, one of his first business partnerships was with Jean-Baptiste Valet from 1827 to 1833. One of Matthias's account books survived in private ownership, covering October and November of 1833. Uh, some entries are in English, but the overwhelming majority are in German, in what we might assume to be Matthias's hand. We think that he operated the tobacco shop out of the tavern into the building, either in the portion that had been the tavern or in the ground floor room under the tavern into the house with that door that opens to the street. The 1836 probate inventory after Matthias's untimely death clearly identifies a room or area where tobacco products were made. He recorded his will on December 11th and died on December 13th, 1835 at the age of 39. So he left his estate and business to his wife, Barbara, to support their six children. Um, of the total estate evaluation in 1836, the tobacco products and tools accounted for more than one-third of the total value. Um, the equipment for making snuff, cigars, and carrots of tobacco is listed, as are quantities of these products that he had in stock. Matthias Ziegler had far-flung sources for his tobacco products, revealing trade connections from St. Genevieve to the Lower Mississippi Valley and the Caribbean. Nacogdoche snuff, Macuba snuff, Spanish or Havana tobacco, St. Domingo tobacco, 
Nacogdoche tobacco, Spanish cigars, Malay cigars, cigars, Cavendish cigars. Right, these are all listed. Unfortunately, we did not find evidence of tobacco production when we excavated in front of the building. Unlike earlier periods, when pipe smoking was the only means for tobacco use, tobacco products popular from the 1830s to 1850s were cigars, snuff, and chewing tobacco. Use of these products leaves very little material evidence for archaeologists to find, unlike all those clay pipes that people used earlier. Right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's likely that equipment and tools for making these products were seldom used outdoors. They were pretty substantial pieces of equipment and certainly not in front of the house on the very slim yard space that's on that street side of the building. This is right on top of the wall there. Barbara Ziegler and their two eldest sons continued in the tobacco business into the 1850s. Between 1851 and 1860, Francis Ziegler, one of the sons, made payments to buy the property from his mother. By 1856, all of the other siblings were married and had moved out of the house, and Frank married, as he was called Frank, married Josephine Moreau, whose family lived nearby just down St. Mary's Road. They raised four daughters and a son in the house, and his mother, Barbara, continued to live with, with them until her death in 1862. So for six years, between 1856 and 1862, and probably longer, three languages were being spoken in the house. German, French, and English. And we can imagine that both German and French cultural traditions were being observed. And this is very different from what seems to have occurred after the late 1840s, when German immigration increased significantly in St. Genevieve. The greater numbers of German speakers later allowed a recognizable community to develop, separate from the French and Anglo-American residents in the town. German language newspapers were published here well into the first half of the 20th century. But despite the greater numbers of German speakers who were in town at the time, when Matthias and Barbara Ziegler's children married in the late 1840s and 1850s, all but one chose French or Anglo-American spouses from families who had been long resident in the town. So it seems more important to marry someone from the community in which they'd been raised than to marry a new immigrant simply because he or she was German speaking. However, by the next generation, there was much more marrying within the German community. Sometime between 1850 and 1860, the family ended the tobacco business. Beginning in 1860, after he finished paying his mother for the property, Francis Ziegler became the head of the household. So in the next censuses, in 1860 and 1870, his occupation was the clerk. In 1880, he was listed as the collector of revenue, and in 1900, my favorite, he's listed as a capitalist. That works at all, right? Uh, Josephine died in 1883, and Francis died in 1900. And it appears that it was around 1860, when Francis became the owner, that the first changes were made to the appearance of the structure, both interior and exterior. The most recent former owner, Hilliard Goldman, gave me a copy of a fragment of newspaper that was found in the wall, inside the wall at the north end of the house. It's dated 1860, the St. Genevieve paper, suggesting that work was being done on the house at that time. The interior was, quote, Victorianized, and the stairway moved to the other side of the middle room. Now, many of you might remember Hilliard Goldman on tours of the house, um, telling the story of how they found the ghost of the original staircase, where it is now, where it's been moved back to. The original vertical log and boozelized structure <coughs> had been whitewashed on the exterior year after year, perhaps more on the front than the back of the building. We found huge amounts of this in front of the building and none elsewhere. Most of what looks like a single fragment of whitewash when you pick it up, if you use magnification to look at it, could sometimes have 10 layers of whitewash um, within that fragment. Sometime later, um, lath was applied over the whitewashed surface and the exterior was plastered. So here, the square nail holes, it probably doesn't show up so good in this, but you can, you can see the ghost of the lath going over the plaster there. And there's square nail holes in, those, in that ghost of the lath. Um, square nails could have been used any time during the 19th century, but the post 
1833 levels at the site contained significantly more nails than the earlier Genes levels. In fact, the Ziegler levels have large numbers of all construction materials, um, window glass, bricks, mortar, plaster, whitewash, and nails. And it suggests some kind of renovations and repairs occurred then. And the newspaper in the wall, along with Francis's new ownership, suggests this happened around 1860 or soon thereafter. In our excavations, we found evidence of two outbuildings behind the main house. And one is farther away in the area you see toward the front here. Um, we found the root cellar for this structure, which perhaps dates, so, so perhaps dates to the Ziegler occupation of the site. Below it, however, seems to be an earlier French structure of some kind, but its function is just unclear at this moment. The other outbuilding has received the most analysis and is the one I was talking about with the, with the French comparison uh, earlier. In that earlier period, it seems to have been an outdoor kitchen and or a slave quarter. However, the same building was occupied during the Ziegler period as well. It seems to have been demolished in the early 20th century. Domestic refuse predominates in the assemblage for the Ziegler outbuilding, just like it had been earlier. The Zieglers did not own slaves, but they did have several servants, some of whom remained with the family their entire lives. Given that Matthias and Barbara raised six children in the main house, and Francis and Josephine raised five children there, using the outbuildings as servants' quarters might have been a solution to a lack of space in the main house. And what do we mean by domestic refuse? Right, for the most part, this is material likely to be used in a household, the result of food and drink preparation and consumption, um, clothing items, jewelry, sewing materials, grooming items, and leisure materials, such as parts of musical instruments. The domestic assemblages here included fragments of ceramic dishes, glass bottles, <coughs> drinking glasses, cutlery, buttons, hooks and eyes, eyelets from shoes, um, bone combs, straight pins, safety pins, and jewelry chains and settings. The ceramic dishes found near the Ziegler main house, likely swept off the back porch, um, were of more expensive kinds of ceramics, and there was a greater variety than what was found out in the outbuildings. This was during the German period. A greater proportion of the dishes in the Ziegler outbuilding were from coarse red earthenware um, vessels, those used in food preparation and in baking. Small amounts of bottle glass and vessel glass occur in the outbuildings compared to the main house. And all of this suggests somebody of lower economic position occupying the outbuilding compared to the people in the main house. Interestingly, the only faience identified in these assemblages was found near the Ziegler main house, and it's the shirt here in the middle. As many of you may know, faience was a tin glazed earthenware produced in France in the 17th and 18th centuries and exported to French settlements all over the world. Production ceased in the 1760s, so you might wonder why it would show up in deposits the date after 1833 in a German household. Usually archeologists explain this kind of occurrence as an heirloom factor. Residents of the site were essentially curating older materials, perhaps as heirlooms passed down in the family. And this is where it's clear that we have to guard against the male bias so prevalent in the documentary record whereby we, and I include myself in this, refer to this as the Ziegler house and the occupation period based on it as the Ziegler household. On the head of household, Matthias, Francis, and Barbara were all Zieglers. However, Francis Ziegler's wife was Josephine Moreau from a French descended family who had been in Kaskaskia and St. Genevieve since time immemorial. It's entirely possible that she would have had French dishes handed down in her family. And I kind of think of this as a way to keep reminding myself of the influence in this household that she had and, and, and on the next generation of St. Genevieve residents that her children represented. The greater proportion of clothing, grooming, and sewing materials in the Ziegler main house assemblage probably is just a factor of the greater number of people that live there compared to the outbuilding. And there's some indication that cottage industries were were being carried out in the Ziegler main house. And again, this is off the back porch. A brass button blank was found. All right, so this is a, it's a sheet brass that clearly had um, round buttons 
faces uh, stamped out of it, right? So it was the result of that. Some kind of button production. In addition, we found several fragments of jewelry chain and fasteners, as well as what appear to be unfinished settings for jewelry, um, stone or glass, um, fragments that have filed facets on them that would have been put into a setting. Uh, having these cottage industries might not be all that surprising, since the tobacco business was in essence a cottage industry here. Combining work and residence in one building was probably much more common than we tend to think. <laughs> so if we compare both of the outbuildings, that from the Janus occupation and from the Ziegler's, there are slight indications that somebody of lower status um, lived there during the Janus period, when we think these were enslaved individuals, um, and then servants in the Ziegler period. With similar amounts of deposited, analyzed for each period, there are fewer ceramics and less variety of ceramics. There's less bottle glass and drinking glass and fewer clothing and grooming items in the Janus period outbuilding. Um, both assemblages contained a similar amount of construction materials, suggesting these outbuildings were in need of repair on a fairly regular basis. And the main difference seems to be um, that it was lime and lime mortar and plaster in the early period and many more nails in the Ziegler. Ziegler period. One additional category of artifacts that I want to mention are called gastroliths. These are materials that domestic fowl, so geese, chicken, uh, other fowl, consume that act as gizzard stones, right, to grind up the grit or the feed in the gizzard so it can be digested. These items are discarded during the butchery process. Some of you may have first-hand knowledge of this, um, but uh, they then survive in the ground for us to be able to find and can suggest the location of um, butchering of chicken and geese on a site. Not only do these birds use stones for this purpose, and what results is an extremely shiny and polished pebble um, stones, but they also pick up sharp sherds of ceramics and glass that might be lying on the ground, which seem to have served the purpose quite well. And here we, come, we find both ceramic and glass fragments that look to have been tumbled Right, and this is the glass. It sort of looks like sea glass, if you've ever um, seen that. And this is a small ceramic shirt that's been, that's been tumbled. Gastroliths were found in both periods of occupation and near the main house as well as the outbuilding. In the Janus period, they occurred uh, in slightly greater numbers at the outbuilding. In the Ziegler period, they were in greater numbers near the main house off that back porch. We have some insight into the Ziegler occupation from that probate inventory in 1836, conducted shortly after Matthias's death. Near the very end, after all the tobacco products and the equipment are listed, we find, quote, 60 heads of geese worth $15. Now, if you remember, the original property was the whole triangle of land formed by the streets, South Main, Seraphim, and St. Mary's Road. 60 head of geese still sounds like a lot to me, um, they were probably free roaming right, inside the palisade. Remember, we found the palisade fence that would have run around the whole property. They were probably free roaming inside, and butchering seems to have occurred probably along with chickens in the backyard of the house and near the outbuilding. Barbara Ziegler sold the 60 head of geese later in the 1830s to settle debts against the estate, but it's likely that smaller numbers of domestic fowl continued to be used both for meat, eggs, and feathers throughout the occupation. So we have three generations, oops, I'm sorry. <clears throat> three generations of Zieglers who lived here, Matthias and Barbara and their six children from 1833 to 55, Francis and Josephine and their five children from 1855 to 1900, and then the four daughters who never married stayed in the house until 1935 when they moved to St. Louis. We also have three generations of Janices who lived here, but over a much shorter period of time. The elderly Nicholas Janis, his son Francois and wife Pelagie Bienvenu, and their nine children between 1790 and 1832. And Nicholas died in 1804. So we have 102 years of the Ziegler occupation and 42 years of the Janus occupation. So why is any of this important? Um, First of all, while historians and archaeologists have studied town lots in lower Louisiana, French plantations, and houses and lots in the trading posts, such as Mishnah Mackinac, 
We have only recently gotten an idea of what these French village and town lots in the middle Mississippi Valley look like beyond the main houses. Robert Mazarin and Margaret Brown have been spearheading efforts to document main houses in Cahokia Township and Prairie de Rocher, but we don't have many examples of the cultural landscape inside the town lot palisaded fence. Robert Mazarin's current project, some of you may know of, on, at the Francois Valley 2 property, has revealed an outbuilding, stone foundation of an outbuilding that was likely a kitchen and also part of an earlier French main house. Thus, this work and our work at the Green Tree is adding to our knowledge of the ways in which French descended communities situated themselves on the land. Second, looking at the outbuildings and the activities carried out in the town lot should help reveal the presence of enslaved African Americans. We don't yet know, for instance, how slave dwellings on these town lots compare to slave dwellings in other sites, plantations uh, in lower Louisiana and the Caribbean um, that have been excavated. Comparisons between the materials associated with the kitchen and the slave quarters and those with the main house should therefore help us interpret daily life for all of the folks who lived in these town lots. While we are fortunate to have several of the main houses still standing in St. Genevieve and across the river in Illinois, very few of the outbuildings survive above the ground. And most of the photographs in these town lots were part of the Historic American Building Survey from the 1930s and some in the 1980s, as we see here. Right, so this is the back of the, of the um, Danny Siegler house, as is this. Okay. They don't give any indication that outbuildings might have been or were even remotely standing in the backyard. Thus, archaeology is the only window through which we can view them. Finally, our research on this site has begun to reveal the daily lives of early German-speaking immigrants to the Middle Mississippi Valley. The Zieglers lived in a French house and entered into business partnerships and marriages with their French neighbors. This highlights differences that occurred in the mid and late 19th century with greater numbers of German immigrants and indicates how much we still have to learn about the other major group in St. Genevieve history. A kind of settlement so different from its contemporaneous Anglo-American towns reflects the different worldview and priorities of French descendant communities, priorities that remained even as immigrants came in increasing numbers. This is a part of the American story that remains largely untold, and it's hoped that continued work will reveal more of that past. Thank you. Okay, we'll take a 15-minute break, and then uh, why don't we just take a 10-minute